This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I will be talking with Kirk Schneider. He's a philosopher who's written many books on human nature, and I'll be discussing primarily his book on the polarized mind. And that will begin in a moment. I'm speaking with philosopher Kirk Schneider. He has written a number of books uh, expressing, I guess you would call, a humanistic uh, outlook on life. Uh, the one that I'll be focusing on, but not exclusively, will be his uh, last book, Polarized Mind. But as I usually do, Kirk, uh, if you could give a few minutes background about yourself, uh, biographically, where you come from, what the main uh, tenets of your philosophy is, and what some of your major books have been about. Okay, well, thanks very much for uh, the interview, Dan. Um, kind of hard to summarize all that you've asked, but basically uh, I'm a psychologist and author, uh, very interested in philosophy, and particularly existential philosophy, and uh, I have been uh, working as an adjunct uh, faculty member of Saybrook University for about 15 years. Uh, I'm also an adjunct uh, faculty at uh, Teachers College, Columbia. In New York, and um, and I'm a co-founder and instructor for the Existential Humanistic Institute, which is a psychotherapy training institute uh, here in the Bay Area, uh, where people can get certificates in existential humanistic therapy. Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I, th I thought you were done. Go ahead. Uh, well, I, I've written or co-edited uh, on twelve books. Uh, including my first book, The Paradoxical Self, which is actually an attempt to translate uh, Kierkegaard's little uh, essay in Sickness Unto Death called Des Despair Under the Aspects of Finitude and Infinitude, which sounds very high tone, but I really tried to bring it down to earth in The Paradoxical Self as a uh, psychological and therapeutic model. And uh, I've been pretty much uh, cultivating that, uh, that basic theme that uh, Kierkegaard brought up around uh, how life seems to be at, at a very core level uh, paradoxical and uh, that we, we are both uh, very small, uh, fragile, humble creatures at the same time as uh, uh, you could say soaring angels mm. or have a great capacity to to transcend and, and to self-create, uh, especially through our imagination. So uh, this, uh, this dialectical tension, you could say, I think runs through um, most of uh, our cultural and individual uh, problems as well as possibilities. Well, let me ask you this. If, uh, as a lay person, when we talk about humanism, we generally mean not doing harm, living in peace, uh, looking out for the better uh, betterment of mankind, the better angels of our nature, so to speak. Is the term humanism in a psychological or philosophic concept somewhat different? Because sometimes things have different meanings. For example, a theory that we use in, in lay language is different from a scientific theory. So when you talk about a humanistic approach, is there something specific to it that a lay person, that it's more encompassing or, or what? Uh, yeah, I think there's some difference. I mean, the things you mentioned uh, certainly could be conceived of as, as humanistic, uh, broadly speaking. There, there is a, a a greater emphasis than many philosophies on human potential and human growth uh, tends to be a fairly optimistic perspective. But uh, more within the field of, of uh, contemporary humanistic psychology, uh, I define it broadly as uh, the question of what it means to be fully experientially human. And uh, how that illuminates the, the, the vital or fulfilled life. Mm. So it's got a kind of a descriptive aspect and, a, and an ethical or moral aspect. 
you know, what what does it mean to be fully experientially human? Uh, so we're talking about more than just uh, human from a, a strictly cognitive standpoint or intellectual standpoint or a strictly behavioral standpoint um, or physiological, but uh, kind of the whole package. Yeah. You know, what does it What does it mean to experience life with one's whole bodily being, if you will? Mind, body, spirit, uh, one way to put it. Well, one of the things in uh, the book, uh, The Polarized Mind, uh, I think it's still your latest book, uh, and we can uh, briefly touch upon some of your earlier works, too, as we go on. But you seem to, uh, from what I could uh, gather, you think that uh, the fact that we have this uh, polarized tension in society, and going back anthropologically uh, throughout human history, that we have a tendency to demonize people of the other side, whether it's political demonization, right, left, Republican, Democrat here in the U.S., uh, whether we're talking religions, uh, are we monotheistic, are we polytheistic, are we atheistic, whether we're talking science, whether we're talking uh, all forms of tribalism, I guess. Um, do you think uh, that the polarized mind is something that had, for example, some evolutionary uh, uh, positives, but as culture has evolved, we have yet to get wean ourselves off of that? That's a great question, and I think it's an ongoing question. Um, I do think there's something to the, the idea that uh, polarization uh, has an evolutionary function. I mean, first of all, let me define polarization. Yeah. Uh, I see it as the fixation on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of competing points of view. Mm -hmm. I think this has been in many ways, uh, the great scourge or, or psychological plague of humanity, dating back to the, the earliest recorded history, uh, we see this this sort of uh, fixation uh, beginning with the Babylonian myths, uh, for example, in the st uh, strict striving for immortality. Uh, but. Uh, it could have an evolutionary component in that, uh, in, in many ways, uh, it's adaptive for humans to uh, to have answers with a capital A, yeah. you know, simple answers. And that's what uh, cultures and individuals have been searching for for a long time. Uh, you know, the search for the holy grail, if you will or the key that uh, will eliminate all fears and anxieties. So from the standpoint of helping us quell some of those fears and anxieties, it could have a, an evolutionary component. Uh, but from the standpoint of s sustainability and helping to create a, a more humanistic uh, or holistic society uh, and world. Uh, I think polarization has, has been a, a disaster in, in most cases. You know, going back to, again, the earliest power centers throughout history mm. and, and for individuals uh, because it, uh, it has cut off uh, possibility for a more flexible and uh, wide-ranging uh, way of relating to ourselves and others. Okay. Uh, more enriching life, if you will. All right. And, you know, th there are many examples of, of how it, it has done this and how it's wrought destruction uh, throughout history. I mean, just taking three of the outstanding examples from the 20th century. Uh, you look at uh, Hitler's Germany, uh, Maoist China, and Stalinist Russia. Yeah. I think you have some pretty powerful examples of both uh, individual polarized minds and cultural polarized minds. And, and 
basically, as I understand it, polarized mind uh, uh, derives from a, a, a great fear. It's based on fear. The attempt to do everything one can to avoid any hint of, of that terror or that uh, vulnerability. Okay. Well, let's uh, end this segment here since we've laid out the beginnings, and I want to explore a little bit more deeply into uh, the thesis of the book or theses of the book, if need be, and then uh, hear some of the examples, and we'll do that in the next segment. I'm speaking with Kirk Schneider. He is a philosopher, a psychologist. He uh, has written a book uh, a couple of years ago about the polarized mind and its effects on human behavior. Uh, human history, and you had laid out in the prior section a little bit of uh, of the, the three bad examples from the 20th century, uh, uh, Hitler, Stalin, and Mao's reigns of terror in their respective countries and uh, in the world to a certain degree. Um, let's let's start, I guess, from the beginning. Well, well let me just, before I, we get historically from the beginning, let me just ask you, uh, what, is the, what is the main thesis uh, of of the book, other than that the polarized mind is not good, uh, do you take it from an anthropological, a sociological, a psychological perspective, or all of them? Well, I think it's, it's quite cross-disciplinary. What I would say is that it is an existentially informed study of what I call the polarized mind, or the fixation on a single point of view to the utter exclusion of the competing points of view. So it's existentially informed in terms of individual psychology, in terms of culture, anthropology. Um, and I, I, it certainly uh, it eclipses you know, religion, uh, politics, uh, sociology. So it, it's quite wide, wide ranging. I, I obviously see a a very striking pattern here around the polarized mind. Um, and it's something that we seem to repeat generation after generation. And we're, we're not very good, at least in the power centers of the world, at, at addressing it. Uh, probably precisely because they are power centers. Uh, they, they often are, you know, these cultures that have... Uh, strongly identified with with um, military action uh, or uh, absolutist thinking either religiously or politically now how how could that have uh, we i mentioned evolution um is is this something that w would just naturally uh, evolve out of tribal behavior? Was it something that as we became more sedentary and during the agricultural revolution eight or 10,000 years ago, whenever it was, that when societies began to complex, uh, is the polarized mind that, I don't know if you studied this, is it prevalent even in say hunter-gatherer societies or is it only something that has evolved as society has evolved more? You know, has it gotten worse? That's, that's an excellent question. I, I really haven't studied uh, in depth uh, uh, pre, you could say, civilized uh, societies, mm -hmm. uh, Neolithic societies, etc. Um, my sense is that the more that human beings felt that they needed to control their environment, uh, not only to survive, but, but to thrive, uh, the polarized mind, you know, gathered steam. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, again, we, we see it uh, powerfully in the myths like Gilgamesh, yeah. uh, where uh, the protagonist Gil Gilgamesh attempts to you know achieve this as I say immor immortal state and uh, the book is a cautionary tale because uh, he, he almost uh, becomes destroyed by uh, eating of a plant that uh, is supposed to give one you know everlasting life so we, we see a lot of these sort of attempts at overreaching and also in the uh, Babylonian myth, the Enuma Elish, uh, 
not enema, but N E N U M A, hellish, which is basically about uh, the create creatrix of the universe and her husband. Uh, so it's uh, Tiamat, the creatrix, and Apsu, her husband. And they attempt to create a perfectly ordered world. Uh, but what ends up happening is that they have kids. <laughs> like so often happens when you have kids, the order is threatened or upset. And uh, this sent uh, Apsu and Tiamat uh, into a frenzy. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, again, this, this fear of... Uh, of, of being vulnerable. I mean, that's that's a, a lot of the fear is around uh, the, the the terror of, of being vulnerable, being fragile, uh, uh, not counting, and and ultimately a kind of death anxiety that I call groundlessness. Yeah. So a, a terror of uh, not having a place to stand. I mean, in many ways, it is our actual condition as human beings. But again. The more we try to control our world, uh, the less we're we're tuned into that condition, and, and the less we have come to terms with it. I think so. Uh, these very controlling parents, Apsu and Tiamat, in, in this myth, uh, as I say, fly into a rage, and uh, they actually <laughs> the, the dad puts out a contract on, on one of the kids to, to have him killed. And uh, the plot is foiled, and well, uh, are you still there, Kirk? Okay, good. To seek revenge, and so anyway, it keeps going on, and yeah, yeah go ahead. Well, let me. I'm sorry. I was going to say that uh, this polarization between the kids and the parent keeps going on, and until. This monster arises named Marduk, who uh, just takes over complete control, and you have what might be the equivalent of a totalitarian state, yeah. and, and no real yeah. ability to be with the, the the paradox that we are these very vulnerable and fragile creatures at the same time as we have a great capacity to transcend that and to create. Well, let me ask from sort of a diagnostic perspective. I mean. We, when we talk about the polarized mind, if you look at that as sort of a psychic or existential condition, uh, if you look at it from a diagnostic perspective, I'm wondering, because you mentioned myths just now, you, you spoke uh, or mentioned uh, religion before. Human beings, you know, we are tactile creatures, uh, we, we are primates, we explore, we touch things. And so we have a primarily sensor, sensible or sensory uh, connection with the cosmos. Then along comes religion and it doesn't really matter how that got started, but I'm wondering if the the coming of religion into uh, human society might have caused this kind of schism that caused a polarized mind. Because here we would have people who are maybe hunter gatherers who know that if they go on that mountain, there are pre predators. If they go into the sea, they might get swept away by a tsunami or something. So they have this real world experience and then along comes someone or some group of people, some priesthood or something, and they talk about things beyond the known that you can't touch, the gods, goddesses, uh, uh, the god of thunder, god of fire or whatnot. Uh, do you think that perhaps that's something where people, some tension might have developed early on that caused people uh you know, the, the schism between what they see in their everyday life and this idea of an afterlife or, 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 or things beyond them. Do you think that played any role? Oh, sure. I, I think religion played a, a huge role in, uh, in polarization. Um, and uh, probably the more sophisticated it became, the, the larger role it played. Uh, my sense is that Religion, uh, like like any movement toward a dogma or an absolute, uh, is in proportion to the degree that people are terrified, and 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 also the degree to which people can deny that terror uh, through you know various manipulations. Uh, so I 
mean, we do have some indication that very early peoples, uh, before recorded history, uh, uh, probably invented some form of religiosity to explain, uh, you know, climate, uh, you know, terrifying climate, climatic situations, thunder, storms, etc., uh, to explain illness. Loss, but uh, it does seem that people became less and less comfortable with their primal relationship to nature, and uh, more and more comfortable with, uh, you know, these very powerful explanations that help them to feel calmer. Uh, you know, these explanations about God watching over us, uh, developing strict moral codes uh, to, you know, to guide us. Uh, all these things seem very centered on uh, the need for, for control. Mm. Actually, Rudolf Otto's book, uh, The Idea of the Holy, does go into this beautifully, uh, where he talks about religion becoming more and more of a, a dogma. Uh, as it developed uh, these strong codes of, of behavior. Uh, and uh, helped us uh, to control our world. And I'm, I'm not trying to uh, paint uh, religion in all negative terms by any means. I, I think human beings do, uh, just at a very basic level, need some forms of uh, grounding or structure to deal with their lives. The question is how much and how much do we throw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. Yeah. So I, I want to move from what we traditionally call religion to even what Paul Tillich, the great 20th century theologian, called secular religions. Because I, I do think that it's not just traditional religion that's the problem, yeah. uh, but we have looked to uh, other modes for our absolutes. Uh, for example, to ideologies, you know, which we saw, as I noted before, in uh, some pretty horrifying forms in the 20th century, uh, and, and even uh, rationalism and scientism uh, could be seen as uh, religious yeah. if they are, you know, seen in a very dogmatic way. And I, I think that... Uh, Theorists like Michel Foucault really tuned into this, where they talked about the onset of the Industrial Revolution, uh, roughly beginning with the 16th century, or even the 15th century, beginning to see hints of that, where we were trying to move further and further away from certainly the Dark Ages, uh, with all its pestilence and its, its ignorance, and, and those were pretty disturbing times. Yeah. But I think we're also moving away from, again, our, our primal relationship to nature, uh, our beginnings in, in a jungle-like atmosphere. Uh, what, it's something I call a chaos complex. Uh, and, and again, we had some pretty good, darn good reasons to move more and more toward a, a, a kind of a linear uh, methodical, you know, rational, controlling mindset. But did we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Well, theorists like Foucault indicate that we did, and I, I do think we did. Mm. We basically turned our back on, mm. on the Gothic, uh, which was expressed in more medieval and, uh, and earlier forms of art, where there was uh, more of a sense of the mystery of being, uh, maybe more of a sense of uh, the, the imaginary. Uh, certainly the, the beastier was more evident in the art of those earlier times. We moved more and more toward a, a kind of realist art. You can see it there. But it's particularly evident where we move toward a, uh, a mass labor economy where uh, the so-called mad, uh, people we 
call uh, you know neurotic or even psychotic today had less and less of a place in society and for copines it's not very powerful in madness and civilization we increasingly uh, segregated ourselves from the mad whereas in earlier societies the so-called mad had more of a, a place in the fabric of the culture uh, just as a kind of a more naturalistic way of living had, had more of a place and a sense of mysterious imaginary uh, but that didn't conform it was useless when it came to our need for labor and very linear thinking well, in, in a lot of the uh, blurbs for your book online, The Polarized Mind, it talks about you making connections between like a school shooter, a swindler, and uh, an ideologue. So would you argue that, that, for example, a lot of these young spree shooters like the Virginia Tech killer or a corporate swindler like a Bernie Madoff or some ideologue like some conspiracy buff who thinks that... Uh, you know, aliens are in league with the Illuminati or something uh, to control the Earth. Uh, do you think that they have, they are a product of the polarized society, or are they, a, a, in other words, are they a symptom of it, or are they just outliers? No, I, I think uh, there's very much a common thread among all of them. So, I mean, that to me is part of the power of this thesis, is that it it. Uh, relates to many forms of absolutism. Um, and it also ties into recent social uh, psychology theory, which is called terror management theory, mm -hmm. which comes from the work of, of the anthropologist Ernest Becker, yeah. which is very much about the, the power of death anxiety. And I was alluding to that before. Any time that people uh, feel uh, traumatized or uh, uh, insecure uh, to the point where they they need to deny again their their fragility and their sense of not counting or insignificance uh, it, it sets up uh, a it sets up the, the seedbed for a polarized mentality so the terror management theorists for example have found that uh, death anxiety, in that broad sense, uh, seems to relate to everything from racism uh, to ethnocentrism to xenophobia, terror of foreigners, uh, to uh, the obsession with uh, wealth and material goods or materialism to uh, 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 militarism nationalism, uh, tyranny. It's, it's, it's quite wide-ranging. And again, if you think about each of those areas, they're, they're all about uh, hyper-control and uh, an attempt to uh, have, a, have, have a simple answer. Uh, this leader or this ideology will solve all your problems. And again, we, we even see it, this is kind of my, one of my growing concerns in this uh, move toward a kind of hyper-sanitization, hyper-rationalization of our world, our, our move toward the robotic. And, and um, again, not that it's all bad, but uh, it has some worrisome uh, polarizing qualities that um, we're, we're Again, attempting to do all we can to escape human vulnerability, to find some kind of uh, superhuman, uh, impervious state. Yeah. Uh, Let me. So, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I'm sorry. I think all of these realms that I was referring to before uh, can be byproducts of, of the terror of. Uh, our vulnerability, uh, our death anxiety, uh, ultimately that, that existential terror of, of uh, oblivion, of the radically unknown. 
Yeah. Let me let me take it uh, or, or posit something uh, that I don't know if uh, you would consider consider in the the purview of the this. Uh, polarization. But uh, I watched a video the other day about uh, the problems of a romantic mindset, capital R romantic, not just, you know, sexual, but uh, a romantic mindset. And I, I, I look at culture today, uh, whether it's uh, the money obsession, uh, success, the emphasis on celebrity. Uh, when people get together, uh, they think that they have to find their one true person. There's only one person out there that I could love for the rest of my life, rather than maybe half a dozen that you might have a 60 or 70 percent, uh, you know, uh, uh, congruence with. Uh, in, if we get a job uh, that's good and we get a little bit of raise, uh, but our neighbors still live in a bigger house, uh, we, instead of uh, saying, oh, that's nice, good for them, we say, well, I want that house, the keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, do you think that there's, that the polarized mind uh, is in, works in these more subtle ways? Because it's one thing to talk about the Hitlers and the Stalins and the spree shooters and whatnot, but on a basic day-to-day -day level, would you say that those are evidences of the polarized mind on a, a personal basis, one-to-one -one for a human? I think they could be. I mean, I, I always believe you got to get somebody or some bodies on the couch, so to speak, to, to really get a deeper sense of where they're coming from in, in terms of their motivation. But um, certainly a lot of the uh, attraction to the person or the product that's going to solve our, our problems uh, seems to seems to be set on uh, a, kind of, a kind of anxiety um, about um, life's complexity and, and the, the struggle to experience the fully human, if you will. You know, the wider ranges of our thoughts, feelings, sensations, intuitions. Um, you know, the, the ability to be with the tragic dimension of living. And I think this is where the existential can be so powerful is it, it, it highlights that, uh, uh, you know, to, to live a fuller life, at least for many, to live a more vital life, it means uh, being able to be in touch with one's deepest sorrows and, and, and unsettlements as well as our, our most dazzling desires and, and capacities to uh, to feel a part of this vast creation of cosmos uh, so um, I think especially for contemporary people it's 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 harder and harder to to see those kinds of uh, contrasts and contradictions of what might be called a fuller life as, as a, a positive life. And partly because they're surrounded by, we're, we're all surrounded by these instant answers. And they're given through our media constantly, through our advertising, um, and actually, uh, a lot of people make a lot of money on, on making sure that uh, we, we, have, we see products or, or people as, as uh, our saviors and as our answers. Because as I, I think you know, our, our socioeconomics is in, in great part based on what might be called the quick fix model or efficiency model of living. Hmm. And, and that's... Uh, it's convenient in some ways, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's very uh, helpful to having a, a, a kind of, uh, you know, a powerful and, and uh, well, convenient denial system. But uh, it may not be the best uh, way to go to live a, a richer, more attuned, or more present life. Do you think that technology uh, of the last 15, 20 years 
basically the internet, but also the the spread from just four or three or four networks 25 years ago to several hundred cable channels, uh, uh, satellite uh, radio, uh, along with AM and FM. Do you think that as people have gotten more options, and we've always had some magazines and whatnot, but it used to be we could all turn on uh, Walter Cronkite and we'd know if man landed on the moon, what was going on in Vietnam, uh, was Nixon going to get indicted, uh, who was going to win the presidential race. But nowadays, if I if I believe in A, B, C, or D, I can just exclusively go to uh, some websites, I can go to uh, some uh, media outlet, and I will hear the same reinforcing notions over and over and over again. And it's not just politics, it's not just sociology. Same thing with, uh, with science, for example, uh, Science, I think, has gotten quite dogmatic. You talked about scientism. Uh, I, I last year wanted to do a show on alternatives to the Big Bang theory, and I wanted to get someone who is uh, who who is a proponent of the Big Bang cosmology, someone who and a few people with other ideas. But I could get none of them who wanted to even defend their ideas because they thought it was done by fiat. Um, so, do you think technology has exacerbated this? And if so, can technology possibly also cure the polarized mind in coming decades, or, or what can? Great questions. Uh, you answered your, your first question. Yes, yes, I, I do think that technology has made it easier uh, to, uh, to become polarized um, in certain ways. Uh, the kinds of distractions you were talking about before, you know, having all these channels and uh, being able to escape, uh, let's say, a face-to-face, person-to-person relationship with all its complexities, its frustrations, its, its upset, uh, but also its potential for, for ecstasy and wonder uh, and amazement. Uh, and, and it seems to me these two have to go together. People can, but people can be overwhelmed by that kind of uh, face-to-face amazement, uh, as well as, as the kind of you know darker sides of, yeah. of the face-to-face. Uh, these distractions are, are again very very convenient for people, and, and uh, they in, in many ways uh, again they make our lives easier. So I, I'm not a believer in throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, you know, I'm I'm uh, one for you know seeing sports on occasion or, or getting caught up in um, you know some entertainment periodically. And I think we all need a little uh, a soothing of of uh, the difficult uh, position of being a human. But uh, how far do we go with this is, is part of the problem. And yes, technology, of course, eases, eases the way because it can give us all these instant answers. It's about appearance and packaging, and speed, and so on. Uh, but um, uh, so the danger is, is cutting off possibilities for uh, the kind of um, life I was alluding to before, and I think that our writers, artists, poets have, have alluded to uh, a, a deeper sense about living, or what I call an awe-based sense of living, the, the humility and wonder or sense of adventure toward living. That, that I think, is a great danger of, of, of being too wedded to our technologies. That said, Yes, I do think that technologies can also play an awe-based role in our lives, um, as long as uh, the technology is is in the service of uh, a, a, what I would call a, a fuller or more awe-based existence, in the service of you know discovery, uh, the adventure. Uh, 
Well, let me, let me just ask you about awe, because you mentioned that in your book. In what sense do you mean that? Do you mean that in the romantic capital O, exclamation point O, like looking at the face of God kind of awe, the ineffable? Or do you mean that in some other more tangible way? Actually, I mean it in, in both ways. I, I, uh, I basically mean it in, in terms of uh, one's whole body experience of, of living seems to me to it can give us this this sense of, of adventure toward living of humility and wonder uh, in in every, every moment and every day living it's 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 ever available really uh, because it's it's about staying open to to discovery uh, i know can't always stay open to discovery. It's, you know, there are just times where we, you know, we're called by immediate things we have to do or just functional things. But uh, I think the, the more that we can approach situations, even situations like us right now, with that sense of discovery, of mystery, uh, what's, what's unfolding, what could happen, the, the more we can feel free in our lives or be in touch with a kind of bigger picture of living that can be very vitalizing for our lives. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I would say uh, you can approach very tangible moments uh, with that sense of awe as well as more cosmic uh, connection, uh, which which we see in the great religions. Uh, I, I think the problem comes in if we become over-identified with a particular entity or, again, ideology that keeps, keeps uh, the capacity to discover uh, from unfolding, you know, that again gives us a very strict set of rules or codes that uh, closes off the, the questioning, uh, the possibilities for discovery more. Every, every movement or every idea tends to have a sort of counter uh, part or counter movement. Uh, I'm wondering if the idea of uh, this polarization uh, within modern mindset, or even going back historically, uh, what the counter movements may have been. Uh, more recently, say in the last 50 years, I think of things like postmodernism, where everything is deemed to be subjective, uh, or multiculturalism, where all you know, they, when we talk about uh, the battle of cultures, Islam versus the West, kind of thing. Um, do you think that those kinds of things, multiculturalism and postmodernism, have been attempts to try to unify, uh, or, or reconcile the polarized mind? Have they succeeded or have they failed, do you think? I think it's a mixed picture. Uh, I think in many ways the postmodern and the move toward the multicultural has, has been a, a wonderful uh, freeing process for the human being. Uh, they've raised a lot of questions about business as usual, cultural business as usual, uh, about traditions that have been become too tradition heavy and become oppressive or has, have divided us into us and them mentalities. There's been some very good reasons for the emergence of a more multicultural and postmodern perspective. On the other hand, I do think that we can get over-identified with uh, that kind of, uh, you know, no self, if you will, or relativism, or um, every position is as good as every other position that, that we, 
we can kind of we can get over identified with a kind of anarchic view just as we can get over identified with a very uh, narrow and dogmatic view and i i think that actually we, we, we lose the sense of of awe uh, in in that hyper expanded way just as we can lose it in a hyper constricted way what i mean by that is uh, again that uh, if we're forgetting you know our, our, our human limitations um, for forgetting our anxieties and our vulnerabilities uh, then i think there can be problems uh, and and also that that there's something to being able to deepen uh, one's perspective uh, so i do think there, there's there's something important about being able to acknowledge one's own lineage, one's own traditions, uh, as long as they don't become traps, uh, there can be great beauty in, in deepening a given perspective. Now, that's different than, than, than equating that perspective with some absolute truth with a capital T. Well, I think that's, that's a major, major problem. But, um, it's it's also different than uh, sort of having the mindset where every position is as good as every other position and we could change positions like we change clothes you know, a very cavalier casual approach to uh, to our lineages and our viewpoints well let me let me put it this way um the polarized mind uh, as, as I take it then is is the idea taken to an extreme. It's an idea taken to an extreme. But certainly there have to be some reasonable uh, times when irreconcilable differences have to be. I mean, if we're facing people who have totally obnoxious ideas in some kind of way, if someone is trying to say that the earth is flat and it clearly is not, uh, there are there are viewpoints. we. Uh, so po a polarized mind, as I would get it, is you don't, I mean, when we're dealing with utter folly or noxious behavior or ideas, uh, that's something that wouldn't fall on the spectrum uh, of the polarized mind that, that you would see as a problem, I would assume, correct? Well, could, could you reframe that a little bit more? Well, for example, uh, you, you're going to deal with people who are basically lunatics, people who think that the world uh, is only... Uh, you know, uh, 6,000 years old, or that uh, the, the earth is flat, the flat earth, earth is, or that if you, you know, uh, people with holistic medicines, or, or these things, utter quackery, if you, uh, or people who have utterly obnoxious beliefs, neo-Nazis, or or, or or the like. Uh, these are things that would not fall on the spectrum, what we call a polarized mind, because it's right to say, well, that is wrong. You know, it's one thing if we're saying, well, we want to come together as a society and solve problems A, B, and C. Here's, here's position A, position B, position C on how to solve that. Uh, rather than demonizing reasonable positions, uh, it's okay to sort of say, well, you know, we simply can't accept in science that the earth is flat because we have proof against it. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sympathetic with with uh, part of what you're saying, uh, <laughs> what I think you're saying. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I see uh, those extreme statements or views that you were talking about, like the earth is flat and so on, as examples of the polarized mind. Um, Again, so, so you you would say that the, the person who advocates the flat Earth position has a polarized mind, i.e., they're reacting against the scientific overwhelm of scientific facts for some reason psychologically. Then, probably, or they're they're, they're reacting uh, in in some fear based way. You know, they're they're, they're over identifying with this one point of view. Which uh, actually uh, has, uh, you know, has has been 
overturned uh, and, and uh, questioned so it gets back to the fear and the terror management thing that is at the heart of what is the root of why people you know are so fractious then yeah i, I think so but, but um, what you were talking about as as reasonable or scientific i mean i'm i'm with all that as long as those who consider themselves reasonable and scientific can uh can frame those perspectives within a continually evolving uh, sensibility. In other words, actually what we call contemporary science is based on a set of values and premises that people don't talk about enough, uh, you know, that, that relate back to the enlightenment of Francis Bacon and the idea that uh, what is uh, what what can be validated or what is valid is based on the detection of the five senses and that is a very helpful and, and pragmatic way to proceed in our world but i would contend that it's it's not the only way of understanding uh, uh, phenomena and I hark back to uh, William James's idea of a radical empiricism, or uh, Edmund Husserl's idea of an expanded idea of science, which uh, relates to the five senses, but can also relate to uh, uh, one's fuller experience of life uh, that, that has to do with say what one intuits uh, what one experiences that may not be uh, readily reduced to you know quantitative uh, concepts or, or is readily measured but requires a qualitative descriptive uh, kind of uh, inquiry no, those are important too and i, I think that uh, to uh, avoid you know polarization or over identification with one point of view it, it's it's important to view science more broadly in terms of the qualitative and quantitative okay well, let's uh, end this segment, and in the final segment, I want to just talk about what you, you think the future holds, uh, whether ultimately these things are culturally reconcilable or, uh, or whatnot, and we'll do that in a moment. I've been speaking with Kirk Schneider. Uh, he's a philosopher, a psychologist, uh, uh, speaking about his book that came out a couple of years ago called The Polarized Mind. Uh, and we've been talking for about an hour uh, about uh, uh, what caused uh, this sort of uh, schismic approach that uh, society has. We talked a little bit about uh, some examples of it, uh, both in the macro and the micro. Uh, as we head now, because we're recording this in 2016, as we head towards the mid-century inexorably, do you think that uh, things are going to get more fractious, that there's going to be more polarization before something comes together? And what do you think might be that thing that that starts to uh, unite it? Do you think it might be, let's say, if there's a global warming catastrophe, will that exacerbate it? Will something like artificial intelligence have play a role? What? How do you see this playing out over the rest of the century, say? Well, well certainly I think uh, those two things are, uh, are very uh, potentially problematic as far as uh, worsening the polarized mind. Uh, anything that that reinforces our desperation for absolutes and for answers with a capital A uh, will will be problematic. Um, I've recently uh, been uh, getting together a, a book uh, tentatively titled the, "The Spirituality of Law: Challenges to the Robotic Revolution." Uh, so. Uh, I, I have been particularly concerned about uh, this movement that's called transhumanism, mm -hmm. uh, and it's been uh, uh, led by certain 
scientific scholars. Kurzweil. Kurzweil, I think, is, is one of the most prominent uh, who is uh, leading uh, an effort at Google, as I understand it, to yeah. extend life. He's a Stanford scholar, a very ar articulate, bright person. But uh, that the basic movement of transhumanism uh, is, is based, as I understand it, on uh, the transforming of human consciousness based on nanotechnology, genetic engineering, and robotics. And uh, a lot of it seems to be the, uh, about the attempt to uh, create an invulnerable human being, mm -hmm. uh, to move the human being more and more toward the, the, you could say, the machine model for living, so that uh, we are able to extend life indefinitely. I mean, there's some great uh, possibilities around it, uh, so that uh, you know we, we will limit illnesses. Uh, we'll have access to a tremendous amount of information, especially if we can, you know, uh, have the capacity to download our consciousness like computers. Uh, possibly have a much more regulated society so we could avoid uh, wars and, and terrible conflicts. But, uh, but again, my question is, are we throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Uh, I, I think that we need to proceed uh, toward this sort of capacity to play God uh, more and more in, in, a, in a very discerning way. And I think this is where existential thinking, philosophy, psychology can be very helpful because it, it raises questions about uh, how, we're, how we're evolving here and what, what are the trade-offs? Uh, are we deluding ourselves about uh, a life of uh, you know, robotics and uh, a capacity to uh, you know, just avoid uh, the, the difficulties of being human as we've understood that in the past. Well, I would say that, that there may be some tremendous uh, trade-offs and that, that human vulnerability is ex extremely important to living a fuller and a, and a richer life, uh, a more sensitized life. Um, and, and that it's, as far as I can see, there's, there's just no way to, you know, to, to trade off uh, uh, sorrows and, and, and anxieties uh, for some kind of um, optimal life. I, mean, yeah. I, I, think, I think it's very hard to feel uh, fully alive without being in touch with, with vulnerable aspects of it. Yeah, the transhumanists would probably argue that technology will solve the problem. It seems to me you're saying that since we have uh, sort of this imminent problem of a polarized mind on a cultural level, that if we do get the technology and it outstrips our cultural pace, we could be in for a lot of problems. Because imagine someone uploading themselves who's got a megalomaniacal viewpoint like a Saddam Hussein or like some terrorist or like some Timothy McVeigh. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's, that's part of my concern is that it could be, uh, become a, a tyrannical kind of state or, or the power brokers of society uh, could manipulate uh, the, the populace uh, based on, on these technologies. But even at a more subtle everyday level, you know, is experiencing the virtual reality of the, the oculus for example these, these virtual reality machines that you know could take you anywhere in the world uh, just by putting this headset on and, and uh, going on this virtual trip you know to uh, you know china or to italy or what, what have you to experience it uh, I, I think those kind of things could be quite fascinating and, and illuminating for us and enriching. 
but I, I think there is a danger in confusing the, the map with the territory. You know, is the map the same as being there yeah. and actually experiencing the, the, the raw contact with the land, with the people of, of such journeys, let's say. Uh, or, you know, the, the, the many fantasized uh, uh, scenarios that, that virtual technology will, will provide us in terms of meeting people that we're interested in or that we maybe would like to uh, interact with, become friends with. Is that the same as us taking the risk to attempt to meet those people or to be in those scenes? I think all of that's important to preserve. Uh, again, I can't overemphasize how, how significant uh, openness to mystery and mystery as a dimension of human experience, behavior, uh, is to, uh, again, in my view, leading a vital life. But again, I do want to emphasize that I'm not attempting to assert an absolute truth here. Yeah. I'm putting this out into the marketplace of ideas, and I, I believe in the marketplace of ideas uh, as being the best we know for sort of sifting out what will be most helpful in the long run. I would just hope that that, that marketplace of ideas could be more than, than just uh, based on a certain physical view of life or an intellectual view of life, but people's whole body experiences of life and what seems to uh, emerge from, from that whole body experience as uh, culturally and individually helpful. Let you know, me... I, I found this all based on ideas yeah. particularly helpful. I know I've often said that I've told other people I think art is the translation of reality. It gets to help us know. And I, from what I've heard from you for the last hour or so, I, I, would it be fair to say that you think that uh, the polarized mind, in, if you could pin it down to one thing, is, is something that developed out of the human cognitive sort of incapacity to fully grasp the reality around them in some fashion? Not only to, to fully grasp it, I think it, it's, it's derived from, uh, from a panic. Uh, it's, it's to some degree probably built into us from the day we're born uh, because uh, we're, we're thrown into the world, uh, as Heidegger put it. I mean, um, to some degree, I, I, I think anxiety is, is integral to being human because we're not gods, and because we're, we're ever suspended in, in an, an unknown cosmos. You know, we don't know really where we came from, ultimately, nor where we're headed. Uh, so there's a natural anxiety there. But I, I think uh, we've, we've become more more polarized uh, based on more and more panic about that very natural situation where the human feels some anxiety mm. and then that we what I think we need to do is to is to come back to to be more present to uh, how yes we're all anxious at some level and yes it makes a lot of sense to be anxious at some level and to to coexist with that, and maybe even to see the beauty of that anxiety. The beauty is that anxiety is a signal that we don't know everything. <laughs> and so the beauty of that, the other side of that, is that we're open to, to possibilities. We're ever discovering something, uh, which can be exhilarating and free. But in order to get to that, it often takes a lot of work, mm. especially in cultures that close it down from day one with rules and regulations. 
So this is where I think we need more uh, facilitators of, um, of support for the fuller ranges of human experience. Hmm. Well, let's end it there. I've been speaking with uh, Kirk Schneider uh, about his book, uh, The Polarized Mind. If you've enjoyed the conversation, his website is kirkjschneider.com, and you can find out more about him uh, there at the website. So I just wanted to thank you for taking some time to talk about uh, uh, your book and also uh, any other th uh, theses you had. Thanks so much, Dan. Really appreciate the time speaking with you.